September the 7th, 2011, a Yak-42 jet descends towards a Russian airport on its way to pick up some very important passengers. They were reliable Soviet-built airplanes that could land on shorter runways and uh, extend that airline service to smaller airports. This charter flight is operated by Yak Service Airlines. Only the crew is on board. Club 30. First Officer Igor Zhivyelov is the airline's vice president of flight operations. In his nearly 30 years of flying, he's racked up more than 13,000 hours in the air. Club 30. Beside him is Captain Andrei Solomensev, one of his closest friends. Get down. Flight engineer Vladimir Matushin rounds out the three-man cockpit crew. Get down three green. Mechanic Alexander Sizov flies with the plane to make sure it's in good working order at all times. It's important to get people from A to B uh, with uh, obviously safe operation and, and good service. In the charter world, maybe more so because this is the reputation of the company. Will they call us again? The plane is just moments from landing in Yaroslavl, a city 250 kilometers northeast of Moscow. Touchdown into Yaroslavl. It was a little bit rough touchdown, a bounce landing followed. Oh, <laughs> a little heavy there. I must be nervous. The president may be watching. <laughs> Yaroslavl's airport is under tight security. Some of Russia's top politicians are attending an economic forum in town. But it's not politicians who are preparing to board the plane. It is another prestigious group of passengers, the Yaroslavl Lokomotiv hockey team, one of the most beloved sports teams in all of Russia. Their fans were fantastic. They were loud in support of their team, and they let you know when uh, you were the opposing team. Mike Fountain is a former National Hockey League goalie who has played against Lokomotiv in Russia. It created quite the atmosphere. Whenever you went to that city, it was, it's a hockey town. They loved it. Hockey is a religion in Russia. People love hockey. People love hockey players. There are celebrities. There are stars. Alexander Galimov is a right winger who has played for Lokomotiv his entire career. Born in Yaroslavl, he's a local hero. Hey, coach. This guy's like me on the four check. Canadian Brad McCrimmon was an all-star NHL defenseman and assistant coach. Now at age 52, he's looking forward to his first regular season game as a head coach in Russia. For a coach like Brad McCrimmon with his record, being an assistant coach with the Red Wings and his playing career, for him to go over to a team like Yaroslav with the passion those fans have, I guarantee you he was so excited to have that opportunity to go and win that first game. Some of Russia's best players are on this team, including team captain Ivan Kachenko. I had the opportunity to play against Ivan Tachenko for many years. He's a fantastic hockey player, and uh, he's one of those guys that was always in front of you in the game, always getting an opportunity to score. In the preseason, Lokomotiv has been on a hot streak, winning seven of nine preseason games. Fans believe this year they have a very good shot at winning the Gagarin Cup. They want you to win the championship. That cup, it's a big deal. Hungry? <laughs> This year, we win it all. Really? Yeah. <laughs> As a VP with the airline, First Officer Zhivyelov has managed to pull rank in order to fly with some of his heroes. For this flight, Captain Solomensev will take the controls while Zhivyelov handles the radio calls. The call sign to Noshna, Yaroslav. Yaroslav 42434, request engine start. 42434, cleared to start. The crew starts the Yak's three engines. Start number three. And adjusts the plane's stabilizer for takeoff. How much for you? Nine? Mm, maybe eight, I think. Eight and a half. Laps and slats in position. 
The flight is bound for Minsk, two hours away in Belarus. For the players, it's the first of many flights they will have to make this season. The hockey players are the same over in Russia as North America. We've got the jokesters on the team. You've got the guys that will maybe sit in the corner, be a little more quiet. You've got the, the guys that maybe went out a little too much the night before and has a story for you. And it, it's kind of funny how that is an international thing. Checking the flight controls. Start complete. Thrust set. On September the 7th, 2011, just before four in the afternoon, the plane starts down the runway. Crew, we're taking off. The V1 is 190. The flight engineer watches the gauges. It's his job to advise the captain when the plane reaches takeoff speed. The engine power should determine just how fast you get, and if it's done properly and the flaps and slats are set right, you will have the right, right lift generated by the speed to get you off the ground safely, as almost always happens. Rotate. The flight engineer called rotate, and the captain displaced the yoke to rotate the elevators up to about 10 degrees. This would have been sufficient for uh, creating that takeoff attitude and the airplane lifting off. But the plane stays on the ground. Nothing happened. The airplane did not react in any way to the displacement of the yoke. 210. Full power. The captain calls for full power. And again, nothing happens to the aircraft. Some of the passengers sense trouble. Planes in Russia are not up to European and North American standards. And it's a, it's a little bit a little bit scary for North American and European players going over there. The runway is 3,000 meters long. The crew must lift off before the 2,600 meter mark, or they won't be able to stop safely. The probably set stabilizer too low. That's up. Adjusting the stabilizer doesn't help. You'll be fine. The plane has enough speed and should get airborne. 220. But instead of lifting off, the Yak-42 keeps going past the end of the runway. Going off the runway, the end of a takeoff roll, is always dangerous. Full tank of gas, uh, people are still confused. You don't know how far the clear spacing goes. This is a nightmare for every pilot because now the airplane is not flying, and yet you're moving across the ground at 142 miles an hour. What are you doing? The crew struggles desperately to get the plane off the ground. Finally, they succeed. The plane is airborne, but not out of trouble. Yak Service Flight 9633 isn't able to climb. The pilots have lost control. The Yak-42 crashes into the Volga River, less than a kilometer from the end of the runway. Local police patrolling the river are the first to reach the wreck. Star player Alexander Galimov has survived the crash. No, it's OK. Help the others. Mechanic Alexander Sizov is also alive. Go here. Help. Please. Rescuers are shocked to learn the plane was carrying some of Russia's most famous athletes. Thank you. 
I'm Gallimore. Twisted wreckage burns near the river's edge. Witnesses record the horrific scene minutes after impact. Onlookers see no sign of more survivors through the thick black smoke. Dmitry Pushkov is a hospital pathologist who rushes to the scene. When we arrived at the crash site, the ground was burned black. Small pieces of wreckage and clothing fragments were everywhere. And in the middle of the field, the bodies of the dead hockey players were stacked. The smell of kerosene was very strong. It tastes sweet. I'll remember it forever. Within hours, Russian investigators are also at the scene. They must figure out what caused this accident. Uh, excuse me. We'll be taking charge here now. James Oberg is an aviation consultant and former NASA engineer. The investigation team had had a lot of experience, uh, sadly, because there have been many accidents. But that experience, as it turned out, turned out to be critical to actually finding the cause of, of this particular accident. Their first challenge is to secure the site. Get these people out of here. News of the tragedy spread through the city, and fans, as well as regular people, wanted to see. Few could believe it, so they wanted to see what happened and say goodbye to the hockey players. Of the 45 people who boarded the flight, 43 are dead, including the pilots. The locomotive hockey team has been all but wiped out. This was a tragedy for everyone in Yaroslavl. Lots of people knew these guys, not just as hockey players, but personally. That's why everybody took this loss very hard. Hungry? Alexander Galimov and the mechanic Alexander Sizov are the only two survivors. They are both put into medically induced comas. I knew that once I checked the, the players list, I knew I would know players on that team. And it was, it, was, uh, it was a tough feeling. Around the world, there's shock at the news. This is one of the biggest tragedies in the history of sport. I think the, the reaction uh, across the world was first of shock, disbelief. Uh, you know, how can that happen to a team of such young, talented, healthy, good family guys that had so much to offer? In Moscow, Fans are stunned when a grim announcement interrupts the Continental Hockey League season opening game. The president of the KHL actually stopped a game that was in progress after he heard about the accident, which was a very touching move. More than 20 people saw the plane's failed takeoff attempt. So what happened? Because the team is so well loved, everyone wants answers. Investigators focus in on a key question. Why couldn't the Yak-42 lift off the runway? Three factors are essential for takeoff. First is engine power. You need enough thrust to reach takeoff speed. Second is lift. The wing flaps must be properly extended to increase aerodynamic lift. And finally, to achieve the proper angle, the plane's horizontal stabilizer must be angled, putting downward force on the tail and lifting the nose. The investigators examine the wreckage, looking for anything that might reveal if the plane was not properly configured for takeoff. Well, it looks like flaps were set at 20. On your way down the runway, if your flaps and slats aren't set properly, if you may get too much drag. It's, it's a sweet spot of those settings, and they have to be in that region. If they are beyond that region, they will not do what you want. In fact, they'll do things you don't want. The flaps on the wings seem to be correctly extended for takeoff. On the tail, the horizontal stabilizer also appears to be properly deflected. It looks fine. 
everything appeared to be normal in terms of the lift. Investigators find nothing to suggest the engines weren't providing enough thrust to get the plane off the ground. You would look at the settings of the engines, the quality of the jet fuel, and those are the things you would look at first, and they did look at them first. Confirmation of the engine performance can only come from the plane's flight data recorder. It's one of two black boxes that record every detail of the flight. They may hold the key to understanding exactly what happened, but they've been submerged in the Volga River. Before they can be analyzed, they must be slowly and carefully dried out. OK, take them to Moscow immediately. Why the pilots of Flight 9633 could not lift off the runway remains a mystery. There's a second, equally puzzling question. Why didn't they abort the takeoff at the first hint of trouble? The question then is, what decisions should the crew have made? When would they have known enough to choose to abort the takeoff? Meanwhile, a day after one of his nation's worst tragedies, Russian President Dmitry Medvedev visits the crash site. It was high profile because obviously very famous club and any loss of life is tragic in aviation especially and and as I mentioned before hockey is is a main sport in Russia if you will. And if you talk to Russian people they, they would tell you we lost we lost part of a family. 2011 has been a dismal year for Russian aviation. The Yaroslavl accident is the eighth fatal crash so far. Less than three months earlier, 47 people died near an airport 650 kilometers north of Moscow. Russ Air Flight 9605 slammed into a highway while coming in for a landing late at night. The Yaroslavl disaster has drawn critical attention from around the world. President Medvedev announces that radical changes are needed in Russian aviation. The pressure on a team to investigate this and find the correct answer to it is always high. But when the president of the country comes out and says you're going to have to do it right because the country needs an answer, I'm sure they felt the whole weight of their whole country and of the families of all the victims uh, looming over them. We need to work faster. Investigators desperately need to know what happened during the final moments of Flight 9633. They catch a break when they learn that an airport security camera off the end of the runway recorded the Yak-42 as it finally lifted off. The grainy image could provide a crucial lead. Whoa, whoa. Can you play that again? The video shows that the plane was properly configured for takeoff. But beyond that, it holds no new information, no clue to what went wrong. OK, they started here. They lifted off here. The plane only needed 1,200 meters to get off the ground. They had about 2,800 plus meters of runway available. That's more than twice the distance they should need. Something kept the plane on the ground when it should have lifted off. The persistent question for investigators is what? They think the plane might simply have been too heavy. Aside from being harder to get in the air if you weigh more, and anything that weighs more is going to be harder to accelerate. It's a lesson that was learned nearly nine years earlier in Charlotte, North Carolina. All 21 people aboard a commuter plane died when it crashed and burst into flames less than a minute after takeoff. The plane was 263 kilograms above the allowed maximum. Weight was also considered a key factor in the US Army's deadliest peacetime crash. On Arrow Air Flight 1285, the weight of 248 soldiers equipped with heavy gear was underestimated. Their DC-8 fell from the sky 900 meters beyond the end of the runway in Gander, Newfoundland. Everyone on board was killed. 
if uh, the weight is underestimated or not calculated at all, you don't, you just don't have that clear picture of what exactly to expect from the airplane. They didn't know their weight. Concerns over the takeoff weight increase when investigators learned that Yak service had no scales for weighing baggage at Yaroslavl's airport. There was no way to weigh the gear, the luggage and the cargo that would be loaded in the airplane, so it was estimated. But when investigators estimate the weight of the team and their baggage, they conclude that the plane was not too heavy. The weight is under the limit. Even with all the hockey gear, the plane was still safely under its maximum weight. It does not appear that was a contributing issue on this in this case, but it shows that the crew was not properly preparing the information they would need during the takeoff roll. If the problem wasn't weight, it may have been speed. Investigators returned to the engines. Using the plane's estimated weight, they determined that the speed needed for takeoff was 215 kilometers an hour. Did they ever get to 215? If the engines weren't working properly, it could explain the disaster. It's very fortunate that the flight data recorders were both recovered and, and functional. And that isn't a universal factor in modern Russian aviation. The speed question is resolved when investigators check the FDR data. They find that the engines had powered the plane well beyond takeoff speed. Engines are working. Investigators are baffled. They can find no reason for the failed takeoff. And why didn't they lift off? The airplane should fly. The airplane wants to fly. In fact, at 210 kilometers per hour, with the stabilizer set at seven degrees, the Yak-42 will rotate on its own. On September the 10th, 2011, Russian Prime Minister Vladimir Putin attends a memorial for the Lokomotiv players, along with 40,000 grieving fans. Two days later, Alexander Galimov, the last remaining member of one of Russia's best hockey teams, dies from his injuries. The Yaroslavl tragedy has now claimed 44 lives. With an entire nation mourning the loss of so many young athletes, the air crash investigation team is under intense pressure to deliver answers. The Russian government was uh, putting pressure on the investigators trying to, to get results, to get to the truth, what exactly was happening. Investigators scour the flight data recording, desperate for clues. Finally, they spot something unusual. Look at the acceleration. Despite full power from the engines, the Yak-42 did not accelerate as quickly as it should. During the takeoff roll, when the aircraft should be continuously accelerating, it was actually slowing down toward the end of the roll. And slowing down is a, is a bizarre, and unusual, and potentially fatal development. It could be the lead investigators have been hoping for. If they can explain the bizarre drop in acceleration, they may finally know what killed the celebrated team and the crew.